Good evening. Welcome. My name is Joanne Fairley. For those of you who don't read little flyers that come in your mailbox, I'm the chair of the Yukon Development Corporation, and I'm here tonight to represent Minister Scott Kent, who unfortunately had to attend another meeting. I would like to welcome you this evening on behalf of the minister and the board of the Yukon Development Corporation to this, the first of a series of speaker events related to, to Yukon Development's Next Generation Hydro Project. Thank you for coming tonight. I would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Kwanlun Dun First Nation and Tan Kwachin Council. I would like to take a moment to introduce the, the Yukon Development Corporation board members that are in attendance this evening. John Weirda. He's from Dawson City. Dan Reams. Dan is from Watson Lake. Michael Lawyer from Whitehorse. I would also like to introduce some of our staff and the project team. Greg Comoroni is the president and CEO of the Yukon Development Corporation. Lisa Badenhorst is the project director for the Next Generation Hydro Project. And the technical team lead is Peter Helland from Midgard Consulting. And the engagement team lead is Dariel Tallarico from Tipping Point Strategies. I'd like to take a moment to share a short video with you this evening as part of our welcoming remarks. Water. There are few things as precious. Yukon has been blessed with an abundance of water. We've used this gift to make electrical power in the territory for more than a generation. Clean, reliable, affordable power. It's helped shape who we are as a territory and as Yukoners. It's inspired our independent spirit. Our geographic isolation has meant that we've had to rely on our own resourcefulness for electricity. It's contributed to healthy, growing communities and thriving businesses and industries. It's been part of every aspect of our lives, from the hospital operating room to the hockey rink, from the classroom to the coffee shop. Our hydro system has served us well, but Yukon is growing and so is our need for power. We're working hard to meet that need. We're upgrading and enhancing our systems. We're focused on promoting an energy conservation culture. We are continuing to address electricity needs in the short and medium term. But it's time now to look at the bigger, longer term picture. It's time to ask, what if? What if we had enough renewable energy to displace our reliance on fossil fuels for heating and transportation? What if First Nations, stakeholders, and all Yukoners could come together to create a sustainable energy future? What if we could find clean energy solutions to serve the needs within and potentially beyond our Yukon borders without burdening ratepayers? But we can't make the what ifs a reality without your help. We invite you to partner with us on a vision for an energy future that provides abundant, affordable, renewable electricity. A vision that will secure prosperity and development for generations to come. issued the Yukon Hydroelectric Power Planning Directive to Yukon Development Corporation. The goal of the directive is to plan one or more hydro projects for Yukon together with supporting renewables and transmission to meet our needs 20 to 50 years from now. With this project, we have the opportunity to look at the long-term needs of the territory 
and create a vision for abundant, affordable, renewable electricity for Yukon. Tonight, we would like to share the results of our work to date and what we will be doing over the next year to achieve our goal, to recommend one or more possible hydro projects by the end of the year. This is just the first phase of multi-stage process. I would like now to turn the proceedings over to Darielle, who will explain the format for the rest of the evening. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Joanne. So tonight, um, well, just first of all, thank you for coming. It's great to see everybody here. Uh, just to let you know that today we actually had a workshop, full day workshop. We had 80 to 100 people out. So we've been uh, discussing this all day, which has been great. Uh, you're getting a little snapshot of what we did uh, today. Although some of the, all the board members were there today and there's other people that were there as well. So we have a bit of uh, continuity from, the, from what happened. Uh, what we're gonna try to do, there's a lot related to this topic. So as you know, we, it took us all day to get through it. It's gonna be a bit hard for us to get through all of that with you tonight. So uh, just one thing to know is that you can give us a call, you can give myself a call, or in a minute you're gonna meet Lisa, who's the project manager for IDC. If you need to get more information, you can give us a call and we can discuss it with you um, or set up a meeting with a, a group if you have a group that wants to get a briefing on it. Also, just in general, um, Lisa will be going over the, the, pr the engagement process and the technical process a bit, but there's going to be lots of opportunity for input as we go along. Uh, the next big opportunity after tonight will be January 29th and 30th, where we'll have another uh, speaking event. Uh, as well, we have a website that you can go to, uh, nextgenerationhydro.ca. We've got a Facebook site and a Twitter site. So we've got lots of opportunities, lots of ways for you to get uh, information. Uh, as uh, Joanne mentioned, this is just phase one, so we want to emphasize that, um, and I, there's some Yukon Energy people, I, I've done contract work with Yukon Energy and uh, even uh, one of the other consultants on it, John Murray's here from Kelowna, and these guys will tell you, and Hector and people that have been involved in this kind of work before, that you don't have a project, you have a project. So we're at really early stages here, we're at the really discussion of what if, as the video said, um, what if and what are those potential projects out there. Uh, some way, you know, like probably a year and a half from now or so, there may be a decision to proceed with something and call it a project, in which case we can get really in depth into uh, uh, what that project involves. What you want to think about right now is we've got this opportunity to be thinking out 20 to 50 years, what is the potential need that we're, we're going to be facing? and Given, as you'll hear tonight, all the variety of hydro projects that are out there, are any of these projects potential uh, solutions to meet that need 20 to 50 years out? So I, I'll just reemphasize lots of time to input into this process. We're just starting. So with that, I'm going to have Lisa come up. And Lisa's the project manager for uh, Next Generation Hydro, and she's going to do a little overview. So hi everyone, um, my name is Lisa Badenhorst, I'm the project uh, director for the Next Generation Hydro Project. So the next, the next Generation Hydro Project is a 10 to 15 year process to explore, design, build and commission a new hydropower project to meet Yukon's energy needs 20 to 50 years from now. Phase one of the Next Generation Hydro Project, where we are currently, is an 18-month initiative to review and assess potential hydro sites and explore how, with supporting renewables and transmission, they could meet Yukon's needs. Yukon Development Corporation is leading a public conversation as well as technical work required to address the criteria of the Yukon Hydroelectric Power Planning Directive. This work will culminate in a business case for one or more hydro projects, along with supporting renewables and transmission infrastructure. So as uh, Joanne already said, in 2013, Yukon government issued a hydroelectric power planning directive to the Yukon Development Corporation calling on YDC to 
plan one or more hydroelectric projects. The directive fits with the Yukon Energy Strategy and the Climate Change Action Plan. Overall, YDC's mandate in this process is to address energy's role in Yukon's economic development and the well-being of Yukon as a whole. Until the end of 2015, YDC will be working on phase one project identification of the next generation hydro project. This will include YDC carrying out technical and engagement processes. There are numerous potential sites, combinations of sites, questions of transmission, scalability and cost that will be assessed over the next while throughout the project identification phase. In 2013, Yukon government issued the Hydroelectric Power Planning Directive to plan one or more hydroelectric projects to ensure, together with supporting renewables and to the minimum extent feasible non-renewable sources of electrical power, an adequate and affordable supply of reliable and sustainable electric power in Yukon. The directive lays out criteria to assess potential hydroelectric projects, including the growth of electrical power demand, financial assessment, socioeconomic and environmental impacts, and impacts on and opportunities for First Nations. The final stage, anticipated by the directive, is YDC's delivery of a business case for a potential next generation hydro project to decision makers. This YDC project has a long-term vision and is intended to fulfill Yukon Energy needs 20 to 50 years from now. There are many policies and organizations involved in providing energy in Yukon. They will provide energy for Yukon's short to midterm needs, i.e. zero to 20 years. Yukon Energy Corporation maintains and operates Yukon's primary energy infrastructure, including Yukon's three legacy hydro facilities, Whitehorse Rapids, Asiac, and Mayo, as well as transmission between those sites. ATCO Electric Yukon purchases power from Yukon Energy and distributes it to Yukon electricity users. They also provide diesel-generated electricity to off-grid communities and operate a 1.3 megawatt, the 1.3 megawatt Fish Lake hydro plant. Yukon government, through the Yukon Energy Solutions Center, operates the microgeneration program where residents and small businesses may supplement their electricity consu consumption by connecting renewable energy technologies to their homes or businesses while remaining connected to the Yukon electrical grid. Yukon government is also developing an independent power production policy to support IPP development and expansion of environmentally sound and affordable electrical supply to the existing electrical system. Again, it is anticipated that any potential project will take 10 to 15 years to be established. This includes development of partnerships, investment opportunities, the assessment, permitting, and licensing processes, and finally construction and operation. The goals during phase one project identification are to re review and assess potential hydro sites according to technical criteria, engage Yukoners and First Nations, and establish a business case for one or more hydro projects by the end of 2015. Phase one project identification is carried out by analyzing potential hydroelectric projects against the directive criteria, which are expected electrical demand growth based on Yukon's population growth, the development of Yukon, et cetera. The second, scalability, for example, Every existing Yukon hydro facility has been upgraded and scaled to increase its generation capacity, such as the additional turbines at Asiac and Whitehorse Rapids, or the new powerhouse at Mayo B. The third criteria, financial need. A hydroelectric project requires significant investment and capital cost. We'll also be looking at socioeconomic and environmental effects. The possible impacts and benefits of such a hydroelectric project will be evaluated such as First Nation partnership opportunities, preliminary review of environmental effects. Obviously, a full-scale evaluation of socioeconomic and environmental effects will be undertaken through the YESA assessment and other permitting and licensing requirements. In addition, particular regard to the impact on and opportunities for First Nations will be evaluated throughout the project identification phase. First Nations will be engaged regarding the location of a potential hydroelectric project and regarding potential partnerships. YDC is actively pursuing partnership opportunities with First Nations and is committed to developing partnerships with First Nations and moving forward on this project. 
Finally, the project location or the specific project location will be considered. To fulfill the criteria of the directive and carry out the requirements under phase one project identification, YDC has hired two consulting teams. The technical team, Midgar Consulting, headed by Peter Helland, is a BC-based consultancy that offers engineering and project consultancy services to the North American utility sector. They specialize in hydroelectric and transmission projects. The engagement team, Tipping Point Strategies, led by Darielle Tellerico, is a Yukon-based consulting firm that offers strategic planning, facilitation, and engagement services to a range of clients and businesses. They specialize in creating simple and direct dialogue to shift challenging conversations forward. There are five major steps to the technical process. First, currently Midgar is undergoing a preliminary review of all potential hydro sites. The second phase, in early 2015, the list of sites will be narrowed to a short list based on preliminary technical analysis. Then, the short list, list sites will be analyzed in greater depth against the, the directive's criteria, economic need, cost, socioeconomic and environmental effects, scalability, transmission, etc. From this work, the technical team will produce a next generation hydro and transmission viability study that recommends a number of options for the YDC board to consider. Finally, a business case will be developed based on the board's selection to present to decision makers as an option to meet Yukon's energy needs 20 to 50 years from now. Concurrent to the technical process is the engagement process, which is intended to bring energy stakeholders along in the technical processes and to begin engagement with First Nations. This will be achieved by working with First Nations through bilateral meetings and a second First Nations Energy Forum to facilitate conversation around models of partnership. Bilateral meetings and interviews will also be held with energy stakeholders and boards. Finally, several public outreach materials will be used, including Twitter, a website, and flyers. Also as part of the engagement process, three technical workshops will be hosted by energy for energy stakeholders <coughs> from a variety of backgrounds and organizations, including First Nations Lands, Heritage and Development Corporations, technical staff from municipal, territorial, and federal governments, chambers of commerce, industry, and NGOs. These workshops will include an introduction to uh, Next Generation Hydro uh, to facilitate a conversation around energy planning, introduce the directive and technical processes, and allow a space to discuss and ask questions. That happened this morning or today. A second workshop will be held regarding the shortlist release, again, to generate discussion based on the shortlist and next steps. A final workshop will be held to discuss the results of the technical team's hydro and transmission viability study. From this, the engagement team will develop a discussion paper that will outline what we heard and be submitted with the technical team's viability study to the YDC board in consideration of their site selection. In conclusion of phase one, YDC will host a What We Heard campaign to inform the public of the outcomes of the engagement activities. We look forward to working with Yukoners, First Nations and stakeholders to develop a vision for the next phase of Yukon's hydro legacy that will power our territory for decades to come. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Lisa, Dariel. Uh, my name is Peter Helland. I'm the CEO of Midgard Consulting. Uh, as was indicated earlier, uh, Midgard is a BC-based company. However, uh, we're not alone in this uh, project. Uh, we are teamed with uh, several other companies across Western Canada and, and in the Yukon. Uh, and I want to draw attention that when we talk about Midgard, we're really f referring to Team Midgard or the Midgard team. Uh, we're just sort of the, the principal and coordinating team and we have uh, several area experts who, who work alongside us. Uh, most notably SLR Consulting uh, through their uh, White Horse office uh, they're leading the environmental uh, analysis and evaluation and the socioeconomic uh, analysis and evaluation. And they're supported by Hatfield Consultants in Vancouver. Uh, other members of the team include Kawa Engineering. Uh, the principal uh, of Kawa Engineering, Glenn Ishikawa, he, uh, Glenn Ishikawa, 
he uh, worked on the Mayo B project. So he and his company worked on the Mayo B project uh, when, when that was done. He was uh, working quite closely with Kiwit on, uh, on the Mayo B project. And then we also have J.D. Mullard and Associates, a long-standing geotechnical uh, and GIS firm. Uh, they provide um, well geotechnical advice. Um, Mr. Mullard, he's, he's been active as a professional since the 1950s. Uh, he's, he's about 90 now, he, but, but uh, you, to listen to him talk about, about geotechnical issues, he's, he's like a boy in a candy shop. It's, it's really something you, you, you should experience. And then we also have George Steves. Um, he'd probably hate it if I, I, I said this, but he's some of our hydroelectric gray hair. Uh, occasionally we have particular technical issues that require his expertise and he's able to provide some, some uh, particular expertise on issues that he's seen on his 40 plus years in the hydroelectric industry. And then we also have uh, a group of senior Yukoners that have, cho or senior and respected Yukoners that have chosen to, to work with us internal to our team. So, so they're not an external body, they're actually internal to our team to uh, allow us to have opportunity to bounce ideas and concepts and and really bring a strong Yukon voice to the work that we do and, and things that we bring forward. So uh, we, we really respect the, the input that they're bringing in and it's been quite helpful to date. So where are we going with this presentation today? There's two, two main things. Uh, gonna be giving you a, a general overview of the, the technical process that we're part of. Dariel has a, an engagement process we're sort of leading the, the, the technical side as was, was explained previously. So we're gonna give you an overview of what's going to occur over the next, well, 12 plus months. So basically through to the end of 2015. And then uh, part two of the presentation will be to uh, describe where we are as of today. Uh, and really what that ex will, will describe is we've come down to uh, a list of sites of interest, if you will. So uh, the Yukon or uh, organizations uh, associated with the Yukon have been studying hydroelectricity uh, in, in the Yukon since the 1960s and, and we've sort of worked with those studies to, to focus our attention on sites of interest. So sort of uh, there will be two parts to the conversation here today. Uh, sort of stepping back, taking a, a 50,000 foot view of things. Electricity is important to our daily lives. In fact, it's an essential part of being part of a modern economy. It's one of the fundamental underpinnings of a mo modern economy. And, and without electricity, you, you don't have a modern economy anywhere in the world. So what does that mean? In really simple terms, it means we as people want access to electricity and we want that access to be available on demand. And this has some very strong implications for, for society and the decisions it needs to be make, but that's what it boils down to in its it, uh, simplest form. So uh, sort of to initiate the conversation, I'd like to talk about two particular time frames to sort of help frame the conversation and, and, and provide some context. And the, the two time frames are a seasonal time frame and a daily time frame. There are other time frames that matter for operating uh, uh, an electricity system, but for the purposes of conversation here tonight, I'd like to focus on two particular time frames, the seasonal and the daily. Things that you know, as you Connors, th it's in your bones. It's warmer in the summer, it's cold in the winter. There are longer days in the summer, the days are shorter in the winter. Snow accumulates in the winter, it melts in the summer, and as a result, the rivers flow more strongly in the summer and less strongly in the winter. These are things that you simply know. From an electricity standpoint, what does that imply? What that implies is that your demand for electricity, your need for electricity is larger in the winter and lower in the summer. You know, simple things, there's more heating in the winter, less in the summer, more lighting in the winter, less in the summer. It also implies that your rivers, which is a source of fuel for hydroelectricity, they have the opposite behavior. They have abundant water in the summertime and less abundant water 
in the winter time. So there's a mismatch between your, your water fuel supply and your natural demand for electricity. And that poses one of sort of the natural challenges of, of, of hydroelectric projects in the Yukon. But there's also more to the, the picture. From a daily standpoint, you go to sleep at night, you wake up during the day, you prepare food, breakfast for example, dinner. You work during the day, you're at home at night, doing your chores, watching TV, turning on your lights, turning on your heating. And what that resolves itself into is a daily pattern to electricity, electricity consumption. So looking at the far left of the screen there, uh, it's hours of the day, if you will, along the bottom. So in the far left, you're asleep. Your electricity consumption is low. You wake up around 8 o'clock, it looks like. Uh, th this is uh, from January 28, 2013, this data. Uh, you wake up, you make breakfast, you turn on the lights, you start heating your house. Your demand increases. You go to work, you spend your day at work, you return from work. Ah, now you've turned on your lights, you've turned on your TV, maybe you're, you're like my family, uh, doing laundry for, for yourself and the kids. Um, so you get a peak in the evening time. And then you go back to sleep and your, your electricity demand diminishes. So there's some very natural patterns to elec electricity consumption that, that exist in, well, in the Yukon specifically, but, but more generally uh, throughout North America and the world, quite frankly. So why does this matter? I'm telling you things that you already know. Why does this matter? It matters because this determines the need for electricity that is unique to the Yukon. These patterns are your patterns. They're your need for electricity. And, and as uh, people looking at solutions or options for you to consider, we must take into account th those patterns and that need. So what does that imply? What that implies is that the Yukon's facing a difficult decision coming up. Um, some of the key challenges and, and reason that there's a difficult decision coming up is that the Yukon is an islanded grid. That means that you don't have a transmission connection to any of your neighboring jurisdictions, be it Alaska or British Columbia. You must produce for yourselves all the electricity that you consume. And more than that, you must produce that electricity at exactly the time you need it. So on a seasonal basis, you need to generate more electricity in the winter and less in the summer. And on a daily basis, less at night and more at breakfast and then more again at dinner and in the evening. This is your pattern. This is what you need to do. And you need to make decisions about how to accomplish that. And, and these are not easy decisions, and our role is to help to inform the, the, form the Yukon and inform a conversation about that. Uh, and like we discussed, the, the winter peaking demand, all this must be balanced, however. It's, it's not need without balance. There are stakeholders, citizens, uh, First Nations, and you must balance your need for electricity with some of the constraints that you face be they social, economic, technical, uh, or environmental. So it's, it's not a simple cut and dried conversation. So you have your, your natural patterns that, that are normal and entirely understandable, but this also must be balanced against the constraints that, that you face as an islanded grid where you're not able to trade with your neighbors. So what's Midgard's role, or what's the Midgard team's role? What we've been asked to do is to help inform a conversation and take a first step on a conversation, as Dariel had indicated. There's a long process ahead, but we're looking to take some of the first steps. And what we're looking to inform is the conversation about what options are available from hydroelectricity and transmission and how can those potentially satisfy some or all of your need for electricity in the Yukon. And we will be looking at not only the economic and the technical, but also the social, the, the socioeconomic, 
and the environmental. So uh, the, we sort of colloquially within the team are calling it the four-legged stool. Take out any of those legs and the stool collapses. So what we're looking to do is inform economic, technical, socioeconomic and cultural and environmental and initiate this conversation with Yukoners or else maybe be more accurate to assist Yukoners having that conversation to help inform that conversation would be more precise. So Midgard or the Midgard team has uh, a particular approach and methodology to providing what we'll call the more the more technical side or the, uh, the, the more technical information to help inform this conversation. Lisa had described in her um, presentation uh, the hydroelectric power planning directive and we've taken that and for, for today's conversation we're breaking it down into sort of its fundamental pieces. So what are those pieces? There's the need. There's a need for electricity with the daily patterns and the, and, and the seasonal patterns. And there are options. You have a wide variety of options available to you. Some of them may be acceptable, some of them may not be. But there are a lot of options. And what our role is, is to uh, inform what those options are and what the impacts are associated with those options. Because, let's be blunt, hydroelectricity without impact doesn't exist. In fact, electricity generation without impact doesn't exist either. either. There's no magic uh, solution. All options have impacts. They all have pros and cons. So there's a series of technical papers, seven technical papers, depending how you want to count, uh, that will inform uh, aspects of that conversation, of the options that are available for hydroelectricity and for transmission. Those will be brought together, the need and the options, into a viability study. And that viability study will demonstrate some of the ways in which those needs could be satisfied with options that exist today, or, or could exist, uh, as seen today, uh, into a viability option study. And what that will ultimately lead into is a, uh, a recommendation for an investment decision by Yukoners. Do you want to pursue and advance hydroelectric options uh, into the future? Uh, we've looked at the studies done uh, since the 1960s up until today. Uh, there were about 200 plus uh, hydroelectric projects or variations on projects looked at over those, that 50, 60 year period. Uh, we have distilled that down to uh, 16 sites or, or variants of interest. So, so uh, sort of stealing the sun thunder from the, the second part of the conversation. So, so the answer is no. Uh, nothing's been determined, those, those papers haven't been written yet. Uh, but we've done some initial screening and we'll go through that in the second part of the conversation. So looking at deliverables, I, I'm a project manager by nature. Uh, I know Lisa is as well. Uh, we'll always talk about deliverables. So uh, need, there'll be an, an economic growth and demand forecast paper. It will outline uh, expected or scenarios around electricity growth 20 to 50 years into the future. So this is uh, a planning activity that sort of is beyond uh, the zero to 20 year planning process that YEC generally engages in. It's a 20 to 50 year outlook. Of, well, six, call it seven, uh, papers that look at options and impacts for hydroelectricity and transmission. So what we're looking at are different hydroelectric project options, uh, how they could scale up over time, what the costs would be. Uh, similarly with transmission, uh, <laughs> where transmission could connect to adjacent jurisdictions. So uh, a transmission line out to Skagway, a transmission line out to the Fairbanks grid, a transmission down to BC to connect up with uh, the Northwest transmission line, which is pushing north through BC. 
And then uh, also included in that is a socioeconomic and environmental impacts uh, paper. And, and really what these do is they inform the initial seeds or they form the initial seeds of conversation uh, so that so that UConners can initiate initiate their conversation. I didn't quite say that well, but uh, basically it's to provide initial information to, to seed conversations. And those will come together in, in the viability option study, which will be another paper, and then ultimately a recommendation about investment decisions. So looking at the technical papers, uh, there's a hierarchy, if you will, uh, defining the need. What's the need for electricity? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to. This is a small enough group that we could do that. Sure. Excellent question. Correct. Uh, cr entirely correct. The answer is yes. Our mandate does allow us the flexibility to consider uh, a large hydro project standalone, uh, smaller hydro projects uh, working together or standalone, but but complementary uh, uh, transmission line uh, enabling trade with adjacent jurisdictions and what hydroelectric plants or options that would uh, uh, facilitate, if you will. So the answer is it's a relatively open mandate in that sense. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, I mean, yes, there were NCPC studies that we looked at. I'm not sure specifically the one you're referring to, but yes, we looked at NCPC studies, and some of them were, yeah, back that far. Uh, so. The answer is, I suspect, yes. Okay. You every known site, right? Yeah, every, every site that we found documentation for that, that we, we could find. There were a couple reports that I think may have burned or something, but in, in the deep, dark past, uh, but, but yes. Uh, so when we look at options, we're looking at both hydroelectric options and transmission options. So uh, getting from 200 plus sites down to uh, a, sh a short list ultimately of ones that we're going to focus on and then options around scaling those sites because similar to uh, your Whitehorse facility or your Asiac facility, over time you've expanded those facilities to match your growing need. Uh, you know, there was first one turbine at Whitehorse and then two and then three. You've expanded that plant to meet and match your needs. So we're looking at that as well. And then uh, on transmission, as, as I indicated uh, previously, your connections to adjacent jurisdictions, and in this case, we're talking about Alaska and British Columbia. And then we look at the impacts, some of the risks, costs. What are the costs? What are the socioeconomic impacts? What are the environmental impacts? In informing the starts of those conversations. And then also, if you do connect to an adjacent jurisdiction, what are the opportunities for trade? What is the potential of value associated with trade with your neighbors? And what does that unlock uh, for potential in the Yukon? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complicated question and there are quite a few moving pieces. Forecasting the need for electricity. We're looking at different economic forecasts and scenarios. And we're looking once again at the 20 to 50 year time horizon. So if, the way I like to think of it is, if I was in the 1960s, what would I think about 2014? Wow, that, quite frankly, is kind of fun. You, you, you get to really think about what the future might be. Um, and what you end up with is a s series of scenarios that distill themselves down to sort of high cases, expected cases, and low cases. So there'll be different things that would inform those higher, higher cases or lower cases and expected cases. But that's what we're looking ultimately to get to is sort of a band of what's reasonable to expect the future could look like. What, what, what's the band in which we're operating? And if you want to boil it down to its three simplest steps, it's what is the demand 
and what are the existing resources that would be there if we did nothing? So, and, and what's the difference? What's the shortfall? So when we look at demand, we look at three areas of demand, residential and commercial and industrial. And we tend to lump residential and commercial together mainly because population is the primary driver of those. So as population grows, demand grows. Also, so does the need for pharmacies or doctor's offices, uh, because and those would be considered commercial, for example, or your, your automotive you know, supply store or, or garage. And then industrial, as has been the uh, history of the Yukon, and we expect will continue to be the history of the Yukon, or the, f the future of the Yukon for, for some time, one of the major drivers of industry is mining. It, it has been for a century, longer I guess, yeah, longer, uh, and, and it's, it's reasonable to expect that that will be one of the major drivers. Not the only driver, but one of the major drivers of demand. And then electricity supply, we're looking at your, your current uh, set of resources that you have, both hydroelectric and diesel, and, and subtracting retirements over time. So as assets age, they retire at, at the end of their life. And if you take the difference between demand and supply, what you end up with is a need or a gap, if you will. So a need for electricity that, that you look to then fill. So options and impacts. Uh, you'll see this slide a few times. We're looking at the, 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 orange, uh, the orange bubbles now. The first bubble or deliverables is site screening inventory part one and two. And, and as indicated previously, we're looking at previously studied and known sites and trying to distill them down into uh, what it will ultimately be a short list of preferred potential sites. Part one of that study is now complete. And are we handing out the study? Okay, Th there's copies of the study over there and uh, a PDF of the study will be released on the, the, the project website shortly. Um, part two is planned to complete in January 2015. And the objective here is basically get to get to the, over the last 50 to 60 years, a lot of sites have been uh, studied. Let's take that list of sites, look at what sites are known and and bring it down to or, or, or winnow, winnow the list down to a set of short list sites that we're going to give quite a bit more care and attention to, more detail for. Once we have that short list, then what we will look at is how would those sites be built out over time to match need? There's no need to build, a, or not necessarily a need to build a site to its maximum capacity at the start. You build it with the optionality to expand and different expansion paths. Well, what would that scalability look like? And then jurisdictional transmission analysis. Okay, what do these connections to your neighbors actually look like? Where would they run? What would they cost? What are, what are the, the parameters? How much energy could you move through these uh, connections with your neighbors? Benefits and impacts. Ah, once again, the bottom line here now. Uh, one of the things we were also tasked with was beyond just getting a sense of what are the costs of, for example, building hydro sites and developing hydro sites, how would those costs progress over time? So how would your commitment escalate through time? So we're at the very early stages here. You're, the expenditures you're doing now are investigative in nature uh, they're, they're narrowing the number of sites but as you narrow your list you'll start spending money doing uh, increasing levels of, of, of study uh, with uh, higher degrees of uh, precision and 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 more time spent uh, getting accurate information so as a, a project as slides get awkward because you didn't see the full morning presentation but as a project advances over the next 10 to 15 years, you, you gather more information about it, you get more feedback from, from people such as yourselves, you, you uh, 
alter the projects, and, and you learn more about what you're building, what the impacts are, and, and you build your library or portfolio of knowledge with time. So it, it's basically what are the development costs and stages to, to progress forward. Okay. Peter, yes. Where are we? Oh, where are we? That's a really good question. We're actually not even at the stage where we have specific projects. We're, we're before that. We're, we're trying to get to a decision to focus our attention on specific projects. So we're actually off the left a ways. Excellent question, though. <laughs> uh, environmental and socioeconomic. Let's be clear. There is a difficult decision to, to be made or difficult decisions to be made around hydroelectricity and transmission. They are not easy decisions. And a major part of that decision, once again, the legs of the stool, are the environmental and socioeconomic. So we're looking at environmental impact, uh, atmospheric, aquatic, terrestrial, and all that that encompasses uh, at a high level to start. And as the projects advance and you develop more knowledge of information about it, you will, you will get more information and better information, but, but that's a multi-year process. We're just taking the first steps in that conversation. Similarly, on the socioeconomic side, looking at uh, land and resource use, uh, heritage and cultural resources, economic resources, community structure, and dynamics. And once again, really what I want to emphasize is we're looking to take the first step in a multi-year conversation. And, and I, I get it, we're saying that a lot, but, but it's an important point, point to make. Transmission market assessment. Eh, we can boil this down to what is the value of trade with your neighbors? What, does it, what flexibility does it unlock and allow you to access within the Yukon? What opportunities does it uh, provide for you simply on a trade basis or, you know, industry? Does it make industry more competitive? If so, why? Does it allow you to build a hydro site that couldn't otherwise be built and reduce the burden on ratepayers because you can trade away surplus energy at times of year when it's less important to you and then uh, import at times when it is more important to you? So, for example, the summer-winter uh, trade. So basically what we're looking at is what's the value of that trade and what are the risks associated with it as well. So now we, maybe we should pause for questions, probably a good time to pause for questions. That sort of concludes part one. That's the overall process of what's going to be occurring over the, till the end of Jan, uh, not January 2015, till the end of 2015. So that's sort of the, the technical process, if you will. Uh, the next part of the conversation is going to be about where are we at as of today and, and what has occurred to give you an update. So